Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our emergency medicine session. My name's Helene, and I'm the Workforce Development Officer at West Vic PHN. Alongside me um, behind the scenes is Jade, who is also a Workforce Development Officer. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land and waterways from which we are all zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience, and the ongoing place the First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and I wish to extend that respect to any First Nations people connecting in today. We commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect, and reconciliation. We support self-determination of First Nations peoples and organisations, and we'll work together on closing the gap. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. The majority of our webinars Events are recorded and freely available on our PHN Learn YouTube channel. Jade has just put that link on the screen. I have our upcoming events also on the screen and you can register these via our website. Um, the link will be in the chat for you. Uh, please make note of the West Vic PHN Health Pathway that is on the screen at the moment. Um, for this evening's webinar, may I ask participants to remain on mute for the course of the meeting and should you have any questions, please type them in the questions box and they will be addressed during the course of the meeting. Um, at the end we will do those and they will be, um, I will ask them and it will be anonymous. Our speaker for this evening is Associate Professor Tim Baker and so I will now hand over to, to Tim to introduce himself and commence the meeting. Thanks Tim. Hello everyone. My name is Tim Baker. I'm an emergency physician who works in Warrnambool uh, and uh, uh, Portland and I live somewhere in between those two places. Thanks for allowing me coming to, uh, to speak to you tonight. Um, I'm speaking about carbon monoxide and it's, uh, uh, I thought it's scary stories about carbon monoxide because every time I think about carbon monoxide uh, it always worries me how difficult it is to make the diagnosis and what a problem it can be if you miss the diagnosis. Uh, we first started learning, having a lot to do with carbon monoxide down here when we had the Cobrico fires, which was a big peat fire, and that's the picture we've got there of the burning peat, which re uh, released some, some carbon monoxide. Okay, now I don't, where's our presentation again there? Um, so we're going to be talking about how carbon monoxide kills, how carbon monoxide fools us, how carbon monoxide hides so it's hard to detect, and how carbon monoxide poisoned patients are treated. So carbon monoxide certainly can kill. So this is a, a story from New South Wales about a 69 year old man who decided to clean a water tank, an open top water tank, but he got in there with his petrol powered pump and then collapsed. Um, his brother, a 68 year old brother, decided to follow him just to check on how he was going. And he went in and collapsed. And so his 63 uh, year old wife got terribly concerned. She went and called the neighbor before she also cl climbed into the tank and she died too. So all three died of carbon monoxide poisoning. So one of the best things I, I did about this talk, I really like talks like this, is when you think, I really know how all this works. And then you do the preparation for your talk and you think, actually everything I thought I knew about this topic is wrong. Someone's gone and changed everything, including the pathophysiology of how carbon monoxide poisoning works. At least you think at medical school, the, the pathophysiology that you learn should stay the same, but everything's changed about carbon monoxide. So certainly we used to think that carbon monoxide caused functional anemia. That is that oxygen binds to uh, haemoglobin, uh, but carbon monoxide really, really binds to haemoglobin. It binds about 240 times as well. Uh, so all your haemoglobin gets filled up with carbon monoxide. None can carry oxygen. And so it's almost like a functional anemia. There was ha there's hardly any haemoglobin left to carry around the oxygen. And, uh, uh, and so people basically 
have hypoxic symptoms and hypoxic arrests. No, but the thing is, it doesn't really work like that. The people who present with carbon monoxide poisoning don't present like people with hypoxia. We've all seen hypoxia people with, with asthma or COPD or, uh, or, uh, um, or maybe GI bleeding, slow GI bleeding and anemia, no, short of breath and anxious. And there's also been some studies that show it doesn't uh, work like that. So um, some studies that people have done with animals, with dogs, where they've given them a, a large amount of carbon monoxide, uh, and so the so a large proportion of their their hemoglobin is full of carbon monoxide, uh, and lots of those dogs have died. And then they've taken that blood out and put it in other dogs. So still though still full of carbon monoxide, and none of those dogs got sick. So while it may be a, a part of the story, um, it's certainly not the only way that carbon monoxide causes damage. The new way is that carbon monoxide really acts on lots of the cellular, uh, cellular mechanisms to cause neurological problems, that's on the right. So it releases proteases which break down all the lipids uh, around the, the neurons and cause trouble. It also uh, uh, directly act, uh, activates neutrophils, which start to cause inflammatory cascades and clog up lots of blood vessels. And it causes reactive oxygen species in the heart, which causes cardiac injury. So normally when we're seeing someone that's had nasty carbon monoxide poisoning, we're looking for these kind of things. So we get neurological problems. So you get edema and inflammation in the brain damaging the white matter especially because it's got those lipid um, lipid around all those uh, uh, you know uh, 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 cell uh, uh, nerve linings uh, and so people get early headache and fatigue nausea and vomiting uh, until they can get collapse confusion coma and later on even when people recover they can have memory problems depression a lot of motor balance kind of problems but the heart it can cause um, changes in the ECG, so you get long QT, it can cause coronary artery spasm, um, it can cause a, a vasodilation and the myocardium not to work very well, so people get collapses, cardiac arrhythmias and even myocardial infarctions, causes tissue hypoxia, um, and uh, uh, then people need to go to anaerobic metabolism, so they get lactic acidosis, um, and also starts to affect people's liver. Um, and of course, a lot of other kind of things too. So, I mean, you get the, if you've actually got smoke inhalation, you get some damage from the other things in smoke. Um, it can cause a, a ischemia, uh, pressure necrosis for people who collapse after carbon monoxide, so they get pressure areas. People get pulmonary edema. edema. People can occasionally get cherry red skin. Um, you might have heard about that as it causes to some way of picking up people with carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide really can make your uh, hemoglobin and myoglobin cherry pink. They, uh, that's how they get the, the meat in some butcher's shops to look so bright and red. They expose it to a little bit of carbon monoxide, but it doesn't really happen very often in clinical cases. Only a couple of percent and only in really severe cases. People can get all kinds of skin changes and then get muscle breakdown. All in all, not a great thing to have. So it is certainly dangerous. So we'll go through a few cases of carbon monoxide poisoning. We'll just talk about how, how they worked and about how we might make the, the diagnosis and how difficult the diagnosis is to make with how carbon monoxide fools us. So this is a story from about 2010. Uh, on a cold day, a shepherd and woman who was separated uh, with two small children left her gas heater uh, on a low overnight. So she said the children came into her room in the early hours, which wasn't unusual, and they were crying and upset and they cuddled her and went to sleep. But then she had a whole stack of nightmares. Um, and when she woke up, a day had passed and she rang her, uh, her ex-husband, confused, uh, and the police came and they found the children dead and her confused and they decided it was a murder-suicide and they arrested her. Um, and somehow in the, in the carbon monoxide poisoning or the arrest, they dislocated her shoulder, took her to hospital where they thought she had an overdose, but it turned out to be carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, and they found that the heater at the, end of the, at the end of the hall was dysfunctional in a rental property. Uh, and so uh, uh, 
um, they had, the boys, Chase and Tyler, had died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Now there's the Chase and Tyler Foundation, where they, um, where this this uh, uh, this woman Vanessa works to help uh, highlight the dangers of carbon monoxide poisoning. So we get carbon monoxide when fuel is uh, fossil fuels burned with insufficient oxygen because if you burn with burn a uh, fossil fuels with lots of oxygen you get carbon dioxide but when you get that you don't get as hot a flame you get that sort of yellowy that yellowy flame you get carbon dioxide in fact that's one of the ways that they say if you look at your old heater and you're getting a yellow flame rather than a blue flame then it's carbon dioxide although to make it more complicated some gas heaters will will work to try and get a, a yellow flame because they feel it looks better even when it's burning properly. But in general, if, you, if your gas heater used to burn blue and now burns a yellowy orange, it's not working properly and you're going to be making carbon monoxide. So the really worst thing about carbon monoxide is its density in air is just fractionally less than oxygen. So it just sits where it comes out of your heater or your engine and then slowly goes up and it, uh, it doesn't move around much. So, and you can't see it, smell it, or taste it. So people can be, uh, like in this picture, really um, exposed to carbon monoxide, and people that are just a little bit away are not. Often they have pictures with boats, because boats traditionally don't have catalytic converters, uh, which, which makes sure that the engine burns properly, so, um, so you get carbon dioxide and so carbon dioxide it's quite a few carbon monoxide poisonings happen around boats so uh, uh, depending on how much carbon monoxide is in the atmosphere um, uh, uh, your symptoms it depends on your symptoms and how long you've got before you really start to get really sick so at about 50 that's the amount that you're really allowed to have for more than eight hours most commercial carbon monoxide um, monitors like the ones you get for 30 bucks from bunnings uh, beep at 15. the first time i gave uh, i was preparing this lecture uh, our carbon monoxide uh, uh, detector went off because my son had decided to open the wood heater and try and get it to work, but he wasn't very good at it. So, so but that was at a level about 50. Once you get to a level about 200, you start to get some headache and fatigue, pretty uh, pretty mild. Um, when you get to 400, it's life-threatening. 800, you can, you can uh, pass out. You can get dizziness within 20 minutes as you get higher. Um, you can get, you know, get to 3,000, it can be fatal at 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and, uh, you know, when you get really high levels, probably like the bottom of that tank, we start at the bottom, you can die within one to two minutes. In fact, when you get really high levels, which you can get right near an engine, if there's poor um, poor ventilation, carbon monoxide can be uh, lethal within two to three breaths. So it doesn't really give you a chance to just pop in and see what's going on and then get out. I told you it was scary stories. All these things really make me scared. So, which of these things have been associated with um, uh, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning? You can have a bit of a think about that. Unfortunately, you can't. It's a bit of a, a one-way uh, talk. This talk, I'd love to see your uh, your faces or, uh, and uh, uh, any feedback you're giving, whether you're looking confused or interested, uh, or whether you're sitting there with your glass of red wine after work, uh, getting a little bit of education. So, have water tanks? Well, water tanks have been associated with carbon monoxide poisoning because we did a are, uh, are the case on that. Winter camping, coffee roasting, push button start cars, gas hot water, bad barbecues in bad weather, water skiing, electricity generation, or uh, no history at all. So which one of those do you think have been associated with carbon monoxide poisoning? You can see as we go through. So gas hot water certainly has been associated with carbon monoxide poisoning. So this is a story about Zoe Anderson, a 24-year-old neuroscience graduate, and actually the daughter of a, of a magazine tycoon. They built a, a nice house, and she collapsed in the in the, uh, the shower and died. They thought it was uh, a, probably a slip and a head injury, 
but when they did the uh, autopsy, they um, found that uh, she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. So um, the, the, uh, they had a plumber in there to put it in. He, he, a gas feeder, he had a bit of a, a rust job. And so instead of the flue pipe going outside, it went just uh, into the basement and then uh, the basement, which was underneath the, the her Victorian townhouse. So the carbon monoxide slowly rose uh, and was enough to kill her. You think, how can that happen? Because no one has a gas heater of a fancy house in the in the bathroom, you know, so the carbon monoxide should have been in the basement. If she collapsed in the basement, it would make sense. But one of the scariest things about carbon monoxide is carbon monoxide can pass through walls. It certainly passes through gypsum wall, bo uh, wall boards, like the plasterboards in most houses. So this is a, uh, a study where people had two areas separated by a gypsum wall board. They did it a few different ways and uh, filled one, one side up with carbon monoxide and looked how long it took for that carbon monoxide to go through the other side, which it really did over just the, uh, a number of hours. So the pores in gypsum wall board are about a, a half an inch uh, 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 in half an inch thick um, plaster border about 500 uh, microns, but uh, carbon monoxide is about 0.4 microns. So it can easily go through. So you don't need to have your carbon monoxide generating thing in the same room as the person who gets carbon monoxide poisoning. Although sometimes you do. So this is a Father's Day tragedy uh, in uh, one of the suburbs of Melbourne a few years ago. Father of two uh, and he's, uh, and he's a helper working at a baker on Father's Day. They put, uh, they put power generators in the, um, electricity generators in the bakery because they were worried about power outages. Um, but uh, uh, when, they, uh, when they went to find him at 7 a.m. to come and do his Father's Day, they went in there and they found him dead and the younger man unconscious. Um, are uh, unconscious in the toilet, in the toilet, but he survived. Water skiing is another one. That's a classic. We mentioned a little bit about uh, uh, um, boats not having catalytic converters. So they often put out carbon monox monoxide and often at the back of the boat and on a ski boat, that's just where people sit to get in and out of the boat or, or to, uh, at the end. So this was a story um, from 2002 from the US. So the ski boat was just idling while one put up, parent put on a ski vest. So a, uh, a girl climbed, their, their uh, young girl climbed over the back of the boat onto the swim platform, um, just a few inches above the water and lay there. Um, but uh, 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 in less than one minute, she became unconscious and unresponsive. So the father who was a, a doctor pulled her out, observed her pupils were constricted jaw clenched, um, not breathing. So he did some uh, assisted ventilations and she uh, uh, started breathing. They called the ambulance and they um, uh, put on 100% oxygen um, and, uh, 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 and found that her carbon oxide level was still high when she got to the hospital a couple of hours later. Um, so there was, the, there was a, a suggestion that on their calculations, the carbon monoxide level probably got to close to 60% for her with just those few breaths at the back of the boat. So all of us, well, lots of us live uh, next to uh, waterways and uh, lakes and the, and the ocean. So people collapsing uh, around boats, carbon monoxide is always a possibility to think about. This is a case that uh, I had something to, to do with, an immigrant family having just moved to Australia, um, decided to have a backyard party coming from a nice warm country. Um, they thought Melbourne was too rainy and cold, so they moved their barbecue undercover. And then two of the men presented with headaches, saying they felt headache and nauseous. Um, they seemed to get better. We didn't really work out what was, was going on. And we said, well, you can go home now. And they said they couldn't go home because everyone at home was sick. Even the dog was sick. So there's not many things that cause everyone at home to be sick, either the animals, other than carbon monoxide poisoning. 
which affects all animals about equally. So we sent the police around there and they broke in and everyone was sick, but not horribly sick. They put the barbecue outside and they all got okay. They all survived, even the dog. Um, you can get it from other kinds of strange things. This is a, a, for an English case, a 48 year old migrant woman from Ethiopia. Ethiopia developed vomiting and abdominal cramps and headache and vertigo. Um, but um, she actually presented to the hospital with a broken leg because she got to, uh, she got tummy pain, felt sick, tried to jump out the window, broke her leg and turned up with a broken leg um, and nystagmus and a tremor saying that she was trying to make coffee at home. So that was really a, uh, a hard diagnosis to work out. But when they went and had a look at the home, she was actually roasting green coffee beans, which is a traditional Ethiopian way of preparing um, coffee. And instead of being outside in a nice aerated area, it was inside in a pan of charcoal. Um, from uh, from our area, I did this is another case that I saw. Um, Hot Rocks, we've seen a few cases like this with people going camping and they have these uh, they have these Hot Rocks and they say, well, all they really are are Hot Rocks. So, you know, they're sort of like hot water bottles. So they'll bring them inside the tent to keep warm. But what they are is basically um, slow burning briquettes. So they keep slowly smouldering and producing carbon dioxide. So in this case, the toddler had a seizure, the parents had headache and and nausea, they all survived. But I don't know how they went with long-term uh, side effects. And push button cars has been a problem too. So this is a, uh, an elderly driver who managed to get the level of carbon dioxide into his house to 30 times the tolerable level, level um, by taking his keys out of the car when he had a new push button car and going upstairs where the car just rumbled along for, for a long time. Um, and slowly, slowly went up into the house above um, when he uh, and, and caused him to die. So now most cars will turn themselves off uh, if you take the keys away. So there've been uh, there's been uh, uh, you know more than 30, 40 deaths from this. You can know that this is the other thing. This is the no history at all can be associated. So this was a. Uh, a middle-aged man who lived alone in his mobile home was found by his friends in a confused and incoherent state. Uh, so he had respiratory failure, cardiac ischemia, hypotension, encephalopathy, a rash, and in hospital he developed rhabdomyolysis, renal failure, uh, uh, amnesia, looked a bit Parkinsonian, had a peripheral neuropathy, had a gaze palsy, got a cerebral hemorrhage. Um, despite lots of uh, investigations, MRI, lumbar puncture, muscle biopsy, EEG, they couldn't work out what was uh, uh, was going on. Um, but after uh, after a week or so, he started to remember what had happened, uh, and his last recollection recollection was turning on his gas heating for the first time in the spring. Um, so um, when they went out and had a look at his uh, gas heater, it was completely um, malfunctioning and just producing lots of carbon dioxide. So it can look like, a, uh, you know, they thought it was cellulitis, sepsis, all kinds of things, but it turned out to be carbon monoxide poisoning. So carbon monoxide poisoning is common and it is often misdiagnosed because the symptoms are usually headache, nausea, being a bit breathless, feeling woozy, maybe collapsing, dizziness, so really, all of the symptoms we're seeing with everyone who has a viral infection, really, there's not a lot of difference between the flu and carbon monoxide, which makes it incredibly difficult to diagnose. So it really takes a high degree of suspicion and asking some questions about, is there a certain place where you your symptoms are worse? Is it certain times of day? Do you have uh, uh, you know heating, cooling, or uh, heating, uh, gas, water, any of those things that are not very good? Is anyone else at home unwell? Is the are the pets at home unwell? Diagnoses that uh, can, uh, uh, um, other clues that can help you. Uh, can, also, can hide in smoke, 
So again, from those uh, the the Copico fires near Cobden. So with Pete, we had a uh, a number of people present with headache, dizziness, and vomiting, um, including this girl and her her uh, her uh, her uh, meaningful photo in the uh, warnable standard, who came uh, with their uh, suspected carbon monoxide poisoning to our hospital. So smoke inhalation caused lots of different things. It caused burns. So um, as you get the hot air, it can cause burns at the upper airway, which can swell. But by the time it gets down to the larynx, the temperature of the hot air normally starts to equilibrate with the rest of your body. So you normally don't get burns below the larynx, but you can get lots of horrible uh, uh, toxic substances that get through to your lungs, like uh, 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 carbon, which is carbonic acid, sulfuric acid, makes fluoric acid. And you can get systemic intoxication, of which carbon monoxide and cyanide are are, uh, are classic. Um, so normally, if you get burns above your larynx, that develops over hours, and you get very swollen airways. If you get lots of toxins in your lung, it develops uh, uh, usually over 12 to 24 hours. But most people have carbon monoxide poisoning or even cyanide poisoning after a, a fire. It's usually it's inside and they're trapped, and it's usually worse as they just come out of the of the um, of being exposed to smoke and gets better um, the longer they go. So peat fires are basically, peat is just lots and lots of uh, vegetable matter uh, that's accumulated over the years and it certainly will burn and it'll burn for weeks and months. So we had the peat fires burning for weeks, weeks and months and the few areas down along the Otways and around the southwest that that can happen. In general though, we didn't really get many carbon monoxide Poisonings. What we did get is just the normal things you get with smoke. So uh, uh, we got you know half as many asthmas again, more chronic airways disease, more pneumonia, and more heart failure. So for most of the smoke, even peat smoke, it's really just the nasty stuff in the in the um, in the smoke that causes your problems rather than carbon monoxide. So yeah, so burnt all these things. So they assessed thousands of people for for carbon monoxide, but probably didn't find any. So how do we assess for carbon monoxide poisoning? So even though it's not the only way that it uh, causes uh, problems, carbon monoxide uh, competes with oxygen on hemoglobin. And so we've got then three types of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin's got oxygen on it, Hemoglobin that doesn't have anything on it, and hemoglobin that has carbon monoxide on it. All those types of hemoglobin have a slightly different shape, and all of them absorb slightly different uh, uh, wavelengths of light. So when you do your pulse oximetry, um, which goes through your finger, they're doing two different wavelengths. Uh, one set to measure uh, oxygenated hemoglobin, and one to measure deoxygenated hemoglobin. And hemoglobin with carbon monoxide on it, so a normal pulse oximeter looks like oxygenated um, hemoglobin. So if you use your pulse oximeter, most people with carbon monoxide poisoning will record a normal will record a normal level of oxygen, normal high level of oxygen. So it'll be 95, 98%. So you can't use a pulse oximeter to work out whether someone's got a carbon monoxide poisoning. You can't use your point of care machines for those of you who are at smaller uh, hospital where there are, uh, are uh, an ISTAT machine, something like that, because these work on voltage through a sample. Uh, and so that voltage changes with their electrodes when it's measuring the pressure of oxygen in the, um, in the sample. So these things measure your PO2, your partial pressure of oxygen, and then they use a formula to tell you your oxygen saturation but they don't actually measure your oxygen saturation. So the level in, uh, uh, of oxygen in your blood is normal in carbon monoxide poisoning usually, because it's just it's just being outcompeted by carbon monoxide, but still sitting there. So if you use a pulse oximeter, the formula will tell you that the oxygen saturation is normal, even if they've got carbon monoxide poisoning. So you can um, send a sample off for co-oximetry. So instead of having those two wavelengths, 
it has lots of different wavelengths. So it can tell the difference between hemoglobin, oxygenated hemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, lots of different things. So that will give you an accurate measure. Um, it doesn't need to be arterial. Uh, a venous sample has the same uh, uh, carboxyhemoglobin as an, as a, uh, an arterial sample. Um, if you decide to send the patient, which we've had people send the patient so they can get an arterial sample, that doesn't work be really because you don't need an arterial sample. And while that patient's breathing oxygen coming to you, their, their uh, carboxyhemoglobin is dropping. Um, but if you take a venous sample um, and you send that, it'll stay stable. In fact, one crazy American researcher took a whole lot of levels of 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 carbon or monoxide in blood, um, measured the result of half of them and mailed the other ones in lots of different envelopes to lots of places around the US and they came back to him after about a month and he measured them the same and the carboxyhemoglobin level was the same. So it's really very stable. So if you've got someone that you're worried has just presented and has uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, best to take a venous blood sample or get them somewhere close to get a venous blood sample and that venous blood sample can be sent and it won't deteriorate while it's being sent. Uh, right, there are some fancy uh, uh, pulse oximeters, uh, uh, the one that the ambulance uses. Uh, uh, some hospitals have them too. They all seem to be this big bright red thing around them. So they will measure wavelengths just through the finger. They're really good if it shows carboxyhemoglobin level, makes it you know, 50, times more, 50 times more likely than not that it's more likely that it's uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, so it's pretty good. But if they're negative, they're not really great at ruling out carbon monoxide poisoning. When we had the fires and the ambulance was worried about carbon monoxide um, uh, poisoning, they, they had this protocol where if your level was less than 10, didn't do anything, if it was more than 10, they'd send you end smokers, they'd send you off to the ED for a proper sample. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're a non-smoker, it was fine. Although, uh, you know, those levels on bloods, are, you know, we can often get with smokers up to around that 10 level. Uh, they had a lower level from for, for people with medical comorbidities, which is probably reasonable. They had a, a lower a level for pregnancy, which is probably not required. And we'll talk about that in a, in a sec. So how do we treat uh, 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 carbon monoxide poisoning? So we used to think uh, a hyperbaric oxygen was really good because it was competitive um, uh, uh, binding with carboxy, uh, 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 carbon monoxide and uh, uh, oxygen. But if it had lots of oxygen and a lot more pressure, that would be better. But now we know it's not just the binding that causes the problem. It's actually the carbon monoxide triggering neutrophils and oxygen, uh, radical oxygen species uh, and damaging um, the myelination of, uh, of neurons. So the treatment really is just high flow oxygen, so 15 litres of oxygen or with a rebreather mask. Um, and so that gives people usually 70 to 90% oxygen. And over, uh, over a few hours, the level of carbox, carbox, carbon monoxide in the blood and carboxyhemoglobin uh, decreases. We do investigate when people come in with carboxyhemoglobin. So often we do venous blood gases and, and co-oximetry like we talked about. Because it has so, so many cardiac events, um, we do a troponin, the muscle breakdowns, we do CK, it can affect blood sugar, electrolytes, LFTs, so we do all of those. Do EEG monitoring, both because it causes arrhythmias and it can cause ischemia. And sometimes, you know, you do a chest X-ray just to see if there's another for, cause of uh, hypoxia and uh, uh, you can you can do uh, an MRI and sometimes you can see some changes to the brain, but the, if someone's got an altered mental state. But nothing really very specific for carboxyhemoglobin. But an MRI is not really, that's only going to be for the really sickest kind of people. So people that you would tend to be admitted um, would be people whose carboxyhemoglobin is less, are greater than 25%. If the level's lower than that, then it's quite possible if you see them after that they've got um, They've been exposed, and so you. But you, then you're going to tell them, well, go and get your gas heater checked 
go to Bunnings and buy yourself a carbon monoxide uh, monitor. Um, we'd also admit people who had syncope, seizures, confusion, all of those kind of things. If you know, had any focal neurological deficits would be reasonable. So about a third of people who had serious uh, carbon monoxide die in the next eight years, and most of those are from cardiac things. So there's obviously some bad thing that's going on, uh, uh, but of course, if they've got a myocardial injury at the start, you would admit them. Anyone who's been there for a long time, like they've been collapsed in a house and had a moderate level for 24 hours, you might do that. Uh, uh, so we used to think pregnancy was uh, uh, important and that, um, that fetal haemoglobin was specially, had a special affinity for carboxy, for carbon monoxide. And so maybe they'd send those uh, uh, people who were pregnant, they might keep them or send them to uh, uh, the hyperbaric chamber. But now we know it's only sheep fetal haemoglobin that really likes carbon monoxide uh, and is, it has a high affinity because that's where the experiments were done. And fetal haemoglobin uh, uh, is no different really than um, maternal haemoglobin, so it's not such a, a problem, but uh, you know, I think people are probably going to expect you to admit them and observe since you've got two patients. So, there's a, uh, our conclusion is carbon dioxide can be scary. Uh, this is a, uh, the, the um, a Victorian campaign, Energy Safe campaign from a couple of years ago, which is uh, uh, don't get cold feet this winter. Um, so uh, get your get your uh, get heaters checked. So I really liked this talk because basically everything I thought about carbon monoxide poisoning was wrong. I thought carboxyhemoglobin, uh, carbon monoxide sticking to the hemoglobin was the cause of the death, but usually it's the dissolved carbon monoxide that causes most of the problems. I thought the carbon monoxide would respect walls, so you'd have to be in with an engine or something to cause a problem, but carbon monoxide uh, easily crosses walls like a, uh, like a plasterboard. I thought that you would have time to, to get out of the place if there was carbon monoxide because it kills slowly, but when the level is uh, high, like at the back of a ski boat sometimes, it can kill in a few breaths in seconds. I thought you really needed to have uh, arterial blood and test it quickly, but we can do venous blood and we can we can test it to uh, it'll stay stable for a long time. And I used to think that well we better rush them off to the dive chamber for the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, but really we know that uh, high flow oxygen really is the is the treatment. So that's the. Uh, uh, that's the uh, end of the presentation for this morning. These are some of the people that passed away in those cases uh, and others. It's really a terrible, terrible thing. Be careful and think about it. Okay, and now I might see if I can get rid of, stop sharing my presentation and see your faces again and see whether you've got any questions. I don't have any questions that have come in yet. So if you do have any questions, type them in the question box. We do have time for Tim to answer those for you. Um, yeah, emergency physicians have short concentration spans. Talking for about 40 minutes is about long as we can concentrate on the one topic for. <laughs> I saw actually on the television last night that um, I was just, finished talking to someone about a carbon monoxide um, talk that we were having tonight and then this big ad came on the television with the gas heater and I thought ah oh, there we go. Perfect I'd be timing. interested if any, of our, if any of our participants have actually uh, diagnosed anyone with carbon monoxide poisoning. So get your questions or any comments into the to there if you've got any just a couple of comments coming through amazing thank you very practical approach thanks for that very informative but scary talk it is a bit scary it is a bit scary one of the things i think is scary is because like people can be sick and um and then when they come and see you 
Mike, there's not much to see and even not much to tell. So we had, I know a case, uh, a place that I worked had um, a, a young girl who presented with a few collapses in the shower and they managed to miss that that was carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, and then she passed away and before they could work it out. Imagine if you'd made that diagnosis, you'd just say, go home and get your plumber. And then, you know, another young life saved. Okay, well, if there's no more questions or no questions at all, I will end the webinar. Thank you, Tim. That was fantastic, really um, very informative. So lucky to, that we can have you talking to our um, GPs and our practice health professionals. Um, so don't forget to fill out your evaluation and comments and any topics requested because um, we do have a, another emergency medicine series coming up um, and I'm sure Tim would be only more pleased to present something that you're interested in. We do have a couple of topics that we're thinking of for the next one so if you've got any ideas on anything that you may want just pop them in the question box. Uh, so thank you Tim and we'll see you at our next one. See you later, thanks everyone for listening.